What would your life be like if you started everything you did at the end? What if instead of being pushed around by other people's agendas, you were pulled forward by an endpoint that you created and that you were really excited about? What if you could end up with everything you've ever wanted without having to give up anything good to get it? If you don't start with the end in mind, you'll never be anything more than a sheep. Sheep are interesting animals. When it comes to herd mentality, sheep reign supreme. In fact, a study out of the University of Leeds showed that if you have a flock of 200 sheep, you only have to get 5% of the sheep moving in a particular direction for the rest of the sheep to follow without knowing why. <laughs> I've seen this firsthand. I grew up in northern Idaho, and I used to work on a sheep farm. And once a year, during the summers, we would shear the sheep. And it was my job as the lowly sheep hand, farm hand, to round up the sheep into a big funnel-like fence to be sheared. So what I would do is I'd go out into the pasture, circle behind the sheep, grab a couple of large sticks, start banging them together and walking slowly towards the sheep. The same thing happened every time. A couple of the sheep would hear the noise and take off running in the opposite direction because they're afraid of everything. And as soon as a couple of the sheep started running, the rest of the flock would follow them. They would take off without knowing why. And they'd run right into the funnel fence for me, doing all the work. Of course, once I shut the gate to the fence, they'd huddle up into one corner, away from the big scary guy with the sheep shearing device. So to get him to go the rest of the way forward, I would hold out carrots and other little treats in front of them. They'd chase the carrots one by one, moving forward until they were stuck in a single file line. And then the sheep shearer would grab one of the sheep at a time, shear the sheep, and then release it back out into the pasture. These are the only two things that sheep responded to. Carrots and sticks. But sheep aren't the only animals to respond to these two things. Humans respond to them too. In fact, that same study out of the University of Leeds showed that for any large group of human beings, you only have to get 5% of them moving in a particular direction <laughs> for the rest of the group to follow without knowing why. I spent most of my life as a sheep. This was especially true in high school and college. Here's a picture of me in high school with my imaginary girlfriend. Here's a picture of me, my first year of college, pretty excited about my newly found freedom. I was a normal kid. I wasn't super smart or super talented, but I was really good at chasing carrots, like getting on the honor roll in high school, or signing up for pre-med classes in college, because that's what all my peers were doing. And I was really good at running away from sticks. I made sure I always did what I was told, and that I always tried to meet other people's expectations. In fact, I even chose my college major based on what I thought graduate school admission committees wanted to see, not based on what I was the most interested in. After college, I went to graduate school, and I really enjoyed the first few years. I loved science, and I learned a lot. I met a lot of great people, a lot of really smart people. But after the first few years, I realized that being a professor just wasn't right for me personally. I had been chasing this hazy idea of being a doctor or of being rich without ever looking up to see where I was going. And now I was stuck. I was stuck because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. In fact, I didn't even know what else I could do outside of this narrow career path that I was on. Feeling stuck is one of the worst feelings in the world. You feel heavy. You feel confused. You feel like a failure. You have no energy, and all you see are dead ends. And this is how I felt. And the stress of it really started to take a toll on me. I became depressed. I started having full-blown panic attacks. I gained 20 pounds. I even developed a kidney condition brought on by stress-induced inflammation. It was one of the lower points of my life. But then, one day, 
I decided to do something different. I decided to do the opposite of what I had been doing my whole life. Instead of running away from sticks and chasing carrots that were held out in front of me, I decided to start with the end in mind. But what was the end? What was my ultimate end point? Was it a job title? Was it an annual salary? Was it some kind of standing ovation? Now, chasing these things is what got me stuck in the first place. My end point, I decided, was simply the actions that I wanted to wake up and do on a daily basis. So that's where I started. I created a wish list of daily actions. I wrote down things like traveling the world, speaking publicly, learning from lots of different scientific disciplines, writing books, creating businesses, and connecting with people in a meaningful way. Once I had mapped out my endpoint, I worked backwards from there to write down a few key outcomes that I would need to achieve in order to live that lifestyle. I wrote down things like get a job that required public speaking and allowed for a lot of travel. I wrote down finish the first draft of a manuscript by the end of the year. I continued to work backwards from there by writing down a series of benchmarks or checkpoints that I would need to hit in order to achieve those outcomes. That's how I mapped out my endpoint on paper. And it sounds simple, but this process completely changed my life. The first thing that I noticed was that all of a sudden I had 10 times as much energy after mapping out my endpoint than I did literally the day before. My energy levels skyrocketed. But why? Why did I have so much energy now after going through this process than I did the day before? It turns out there's a scientific explanation for this. In the 1950s, a guy named Kurt Richter, who graduated from Harvard University, and went on to be a professor at John Hopkins University, did a series of experiments I like to refer to as the hope experiments. And what he did was he took two groups of rats. The first group of rats he put in a high-sided bucket of circulating water and had them swim as long as they could before sinking. Guess how long the average rat can swim for? 15 minutes, that's it. The second group of rats he put in the same buckets of circulating water, had them swim as long as they could, and then when they started to sink, he saved the rats, dried them off, and let them rest for a little bit. Guess how long the rats could swim the second time after he put them back in the buckets after resting? 60 hours. 60 hours. 240 times longer than the first group of rats. But how is this possible? He didn't inject the rats with steroids. The rats didn't rest long enough to grow 240 times as much muscle. What happened? Dr. Richter's group concluded that the rats were given hope. They had a vision of what being saved looked like, and they kept swimming for it. A better conclusion is the rats were given energy through hope. That vision of being saved energized them and allow them to continue to swim 240 times longer. Let me give you a more practical example. Have any of you in here ever played a sport or done any kind of working out ever? When I was in college and high school, I wrestled. And a couple of times a week during wrestling season, our coaches would make us go out to the track and do line sprints. And sprint workouts are the worst. They're exhausting, I hated them. And our coaches would never tell us how many sprints we had to do. We would just keep running back and forth, back and forth. But then, no matter how many sprints we did, when our coaches finally yelled out, last one, give everything, all of a sudden we had 10 times as much energy for that last sprint than we did the sprint before. Why was that? It's because what we had in front of us was defined. The more you define what you have in front of you, the more energy you'll have to complete it. The second thing that I noticed after mapping out my endpoint on paper was that I started seeing opportunities everywhere. I started seeing ways to get to my endpoint in everything that I did. Everything that I read, saw, heard, I found ways to get there. I started seeing opportunities when literally the day before, I saw nothing but dead ends. But why was that? Why was I seeing opportunities now when I saw nothing but dead ends before? It turns out there's a scientific explanation for this, too. Studies out of Virginia Tech 
and Dominican University in California show that people who write down their goals are 33% more likely to achieve them. Those same studies, though, they show that 80% of Americans don't have goals, written or unwritten. That means I could ask eight out of 10 of you, point blank, what do you want out of life? And you wouldn't be able to articulate it. The studies also show that less than 6% of the population actually writes down their goals, and less than 1% of the population writes down their goals and reviews them on a weekly basis. If that doesn't grab your attention, people who write down their goals earn nine times as much money as people who don't. That's the difference between $30,000 a year and $270,000 a year, over a quarter million dollars a year. Now, of course, if you write down your goals or map out your endpoint on paper, a magic genie doesn't appear and give you everything you want. You still have to take action. But what it does is it puts your goals, it puts your endpoint into your awareness. It puts it into part of your brain called your reticular activating system, specifically your reticular formation. This is the part of your brain that makes you aware of things. Let me give you a practical example of this too. In graduate school, this was the car that I wanted. A cherry red Ferrari F-150. Pretty cool, right? This was the car that I could afford. A poo brown POS. So I met somewhere in the middle, and I got a reasonably priced navy blue car with fairly low miles. This was my car on the first day that I owned it. This is my car on the second day that I owned it. But eventually I got it working, and that first week when I started driving it, I noticed something funny. I started seeing that same navy blue car everywhere that I went, but I never saw it before. That week I started seeing it in town, driving past me on the road. I saw it on freeways, highways. I saw it in the parking lots that I went into, everywhere. But before buying the car, I never saw it, never saw it once. Why, did, why was I seeing it everywhere now? It's not because sales of that car spiked the week that I bought it. It's because now it was in my awareness. It was in that part of my brain, the reticular activating system. This is the same thing that happens when you map out your endpoint on paper. You'll start seeing ways to get to that endpoint everywhere in everything that you do. Now, you don't have to stop at writing down your goals or mapping out your endpoint on paper. You can take it a step further. You can create what I call our endpoint props. My favorite story of somebody using an endpoint prop to achieve the lifestyle of their dreams is that of Jim Carrey. For those of you who don't know, Jim Carrey is one of the most successful comedians of all time. But this wasn't always the case. In the 1980s, he was working as a busboy and doing other odd jobs in Los Angeles. And he was poor. In fact, at one point in his life, he was so poor that he was living in his car with his family. But as he was working in Los Angeles, every night when he would get off work, he would drive up to Mulholland Drive, overlooking the Hollywood Hills, and he would write down and review his goals. But one particular night, he took it a step further, and he created an endpoint prop. He took out a check from his checkbook, and he wrote himself out a check for $10 million. He postdated it for Thanksgiving 1995, and in the memo, he put for acting services rendered. Sure enough, almost 10 years later, in October 1995, he received a check for $10 million for acting in the movie Dumb and Dumber. Anything is possible when you start with the end in mind. Endpoint props are something I've used in my own life. Back in graduate school, I created a vision board, kind of a symbol of my endpoint. I posted pictures of people who were in shape because I had gotten out of shape. I posted pictures of healthy kidneys because my kidneys were unhealthy. I posted pictures of the world and places in the world that I wanted to go because I had never left the country. I posted pictures of quotes, things I wanted to do, have, experience. And in big block letters, I posted Isaiah Henkel Enterprises because I always wanted to start my own business. Less than three years later, I've been fortunate enough to be able to do many of these things. I've started several successful businesses. I've traveled the world extensively. I've given almost 300 seminars now in over 22 different countries. I'm about to publish my first book, Black Hole Focus, with one of the largest publishing houses in the world. And just three weeks ago, I went to the doctors 
and I found out that my kidneys are functioning normally again. I don't say this to impress you. Many people have done much more impressive things than me, including the other speakers here today. I say this to impress upon you that anything is possible for you personally when you start with the end in mind. If you don't start with the end in mind, you'll never be anything more than a sheep. But if you start with the end in mind, you'll be the leader of your own life, you'll end up with everything you've ever wanted, and you won't have to give up anything good to get it. Thank you.